All right. All right, well, welcome everyone to the inaugural uh, CMTC online uh, seminar. Um, so it's our great pleasure today to have uh, Jen Kano giving, our, uh, giving the seminar. Um, so Jen is, uh, did her PhD with Chaitan Nayak at um, the Santa Barbara and then postdoc at uh, Princeton and is now a professor at uh, Stony Brook and also a, a research scientist at um, the Flatiron Institute. Um, she's done a lot of important work on quantum Hall systems and on um, the, the burgeoning field of topological quantum chemistry and a wide range of other uh, such topics. And uh, so today she's going to be talking about um, higher order topological phases. So uh, go ahead and take it away, Jen. Thanks, Danny. So yeah, thanks for the invitation to speak. Uh, it's great to have an opportunity to share my work. Uh, so, so the main point of this talk is that we have a new idea to probe um, higher order topological insulators or possibly other topological phases through lattice dislocations. And uh, previously there's been work on using lattice dislocations to probe weak topological insulators. So this will be um, a little bit different than that and I'll explain how. Um, so we can consider it to be a refined uh, classification which is in progress. Um, but before getting to that, I will um, give a kind of brief review of topological crystalline insulators and higher order TIs, and then talk, also spend a little bit of time talking about material candidates, because I think what's interesting is that there are several materials that are predicted or even observed to realize this higher order TI phase. So that kind of motivates the search to find uh, new and better probes um, for these materials. So um, to start from the beginning, so this is a table of the uh, probably pretty well known to this audience uh, tenfold way. So across the top is dimensions, uh, down the side is symmetry classes. This is the classification of topological insulators with internal symmetry. So internal symmetry is meaning acts on one single lattice site. And I've circled some of the more well-known phases uh, for, for people who for whom the table is unfamiliar. Um, if we have crystal symmetry, then it goes beyond this classification. Um, and so uh, in the past decade or so, there's been several different types of topological crystalline insulators that have been proposed. Um, so I gave a few examples here. Each one of these has their own classification. But um, this classification has emerged in a rather ad hoc way. That is, different phases have been discovered, but there wasn't really a unifying principle. And so I think um, one of the main advances in this field has been the classification of topological crystalline insulators in any space group. And so this is uh, work that I did um, as part of a collaboration in my postdoc. This is one of the references and also done um, by this collaboration that I cited here. These are two uh, parallel approaches, but the idea is kind of similar. And so just to give an overview of how this works, the idea is that you can make a list, it's basically a basis set of all possible atomic limit phases. These would be what we would call trivial insulators. We can actually enumerate these or enumerate a basis for these. And we can look how symmetry acts on these phases first in real space because we're thinking about trivial, you know, completely trivial atomic limits. Then we can Fourier transform that and in momentum space what we get is a set of um, symmetry labels. So what I mean is at each high symmetry point there'll be some EREP which has, for example, these labels that I've shown here. And if we have all of these for the atomic limit phases, we can deduce that if you give me some band structure and you want to try to understand its topology, we can look at the symmetry labels of that phase and see does it match any of our atomic limit phases or not. If it doesn't match, then we know it doesn't correspond to an atomic limit. So that's a very brief overview. Um, we recently wrote this review article, which is now on the archive, so I'll advertise it here. I think this is um, kind of a stepping stone before reading the original papers. But um, there's been a few 
important outcomes that have come out of this classification, I think. So the, um, the first important outcome is that there is now freely available uh, topological materials databases and crystal databases online. So the first of these that I've listed is the Bilbao Crystal Graphic Server. Um, this has been around for a while, but I've been part of a team that's added some data to this server, which is basically enumerating all these atomic limit phases. And so if you log in and look in a particular space group, uh, you can see all the different a basis set of atomic limit phases in that space group and what the symmetry eigenvalues are. Um, so that's the, that's the way that you could figure out what the classification is in that space group. These second two websites are materials websites. And so they've, um, the input is a bunch of ab initio calculations for, um, I, I think, at least tens of thousands or possibly more materials where these eigenvalues have been calculated and symmetry indices have been computed. So that's one really important outcome uh, of this. The second outcome, which I'm not going to talk about um, except for the next one minute, is that this classification has given us a distinction between stable and uh, what's now called fragile topological insulators. So uh, a, a stable topological insulator is the concept that we're familiar with, which is if you have a topological phase, you can add any kind of trivial phase on top of that um, by adding more degrees of freedom and you won't change the topology of that phase or the topological classification. A fragile topological insulator doesn't have this property. Uh, you can add something trivial to it and that will actually make it into a new trivial insulator. So you might wonder, well, what's topological about a fragile phase then? What's topological is that we can show from symmetry eigenvalues that it doesn't have any atomic limit. There is no, it doesn't match up to any real space um, to any configuration of atoms and orbitals in real space based on symmetry eigenvalues. So it's not trivial, but it's not quite um, topological in the normal sense either. So, um, so that's been dubbed a fragile TI and that's kind of a whole different, a whole different seminar. The thing that I am going to talk about is um, this refined bulk edge correspondence, which has led to higher order topological insulators. So that's the focus of this talk. So um, what is a higher order topological insulator? So in a higher order topological insulator, um, the bulk is gapped, the surfaces are gapped, but you have gapless modes where two surfaces meet. And so what this left-hand picture is showing, um, this is an example of a higher order TI phase protected by the product of a C4 rotation and time reversal. Um, and so in this phase, all the white space is gapped. So all these surfaces are gapped, but you can see like where two surfaces meet, there's a gapless mode. And the, um, in this phase, the gapless modes are chiral. So this arrow is denoting their chirality. So there's two going down and two going up. Now you might wonder, is this a proper 3D topological phase? Or in other words, could we add anything to the surface that would um, trivialize these corner or hinge states? And so if you were to try to add something to the surface, uh, since this thing is a chiral mode, it's like the edge of a quantum Hall state or the edge of a churn insulator, you might think about pasting a 2D churn insulator onto the surface. So that's what this right-hand picture is showing. You could paste a copy of this onto the surface to try to um, neutralize this hinge mode. But because this system has C4 times T symmetry, if you want to paste something on this surface, you also need to paste a rotated and time reversed copy here on the other surface, again on the other surface, and again on the other surface. Once you've added all four of these, you can see that like where this hinge mode is going now downwards, we've added two surface states, um, two surface phases, which have um, one dimensional chiral modes, and two of them are going up. So we've traded one down for two up, so we, we can't gap, um, so we can't actually gap out this, this hinge mode in that way. And so what this shows is that by changing the surface physics, you can change the chirality of this mode, or you can change the number of modes uh, mod two, but you can't get rid of it. And so that shows that this is a bulk phase because you can't get rid of these hinge modes by surface perturbation um, or even a surface phase transition, but, uh, but you can change it mod two. So 
that's just one example. Um, there's many different types of higher order topological insulators. So they can be protected by, for example, point group symmetries. Um, you can have magnetic point groups, like I just said, C4 and time reversal. Um, you can have superconducting phases. So this um, has been studied a lot by you guys at, um, at Maryland. And then also you can even have higher order topological semi-metals. Uh, which have hinge states for kind of hinge arcs that would connect the projection of uh, gapless points in the bulk. So when you use the phrase higher order topological insulator, it's actually referring to many different types of phases. And I also want to say this is just an example uh, of several examples. Um, there's there's many other references on this and I didn't cite them all here and I don't want anyone to think that their work has been missed. This is just a subset. Oh. Hey, hey, Jen. Mm -hmm. This is Jay. Yes. Oh, uh, so, sorry. So in the previous slide, mm -hmm. I, I should know this, but I, I kind of forgot. So you had the red edges at vertical chiral edges going yes. up and going down. Yeah. Where did they go? So like, ah, yeah. So this yeah, would be a uh, good question. So this would be, um, I guess the picture is corresponding to something infinite. If we make a finite size sample, uh, actually, in this case, I think the top surface will also be gapless. Uh huh. Okay. So you, okay. you so could some imagine kind of, yeah, some kind of gapless. Yeah. Exactly. And I, uh, yeah. Exactly. I think you can probably prove that it has to be a gapless surface. Okay. Okay. Because something has to happen. <laughs> something has to happen, yeah, right? Okay. So, so we right. can contrast that with what I was. Um, there's basically no, okay, so what you could do is connect these across the diagonal. That could be something that happens. Um, well, then the, well, the. Actually, uh, or you, oh, anyway, I'm pretty sure the top work. surface is gapless. Anyway, yeah, it's gapless. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Good, good question. So, um, okay, so that's actually a good contrast to where I was going, which is um, in this talk, I'm going to talk about a particular type of higher order TI, which is protected by inversion and time reversal. So when I say higher order TI, that's what I mean. And in this case, um, it, this is actually a good segue from Jay's question. In this case, the, uh, the hinge mode traces out a path. So actually all the surfaces are gapped and, um, and you end up with this path of gapless mode, which is separating two halves that are related by inversion symmetry. So, so there's other possible paths that this could take, um, but it always has to separate the two different halves. Uh, and because this system has time reversal, instead of these modes being chiral, they're helical modes. So, you know, colloquially spin up going one way, spin down going the other way. You could ask the same question here could we remove this helical mode by some kind of surface um, phase transition or by pasting something on the surface? So what you would want to paste now is a 2D TI because the edge of a 2D TI is exactly a helical mode, like the, it's identical to these helical modes. So you could ask, could I paste a 2D TI on like the lower half to try to cancel out this, this yellow helical mode that we had in the first place? But inversion symmetry would require you to paste another 2D TI on the inversion um, uh, counterpart of the lower half. And what you'll get as a result is that you now have three helical modes instead of one. A helical mode is really only defined mod two. Two modes can gap each other. So you haven't changed the edge physics here. And so this is showing the same thing I showed before that um, that you can't get rid of these modes by, uh, by pasting something onto the surface. And that shows that this is actually a proper bulk um, topological phase. This, uh, this inversion and time reversal protected phase uh, was shown um, in this paper here to have a Z4 classification. And it's actually really nice. There's a Z4 index, which you can straightforwardly compute by inversion eigenvalues. So this formula is just saying, look at your occupied bands, count the number of positive inversion eigenvalues, count the number of negative, take the difference, divide by four, and take it mod four. And they prove that this is a proper, uh, well-defined mod four index. Um, and in addition, the parity of this index gives the parity of the usual Z2 Foucane index for a 3D TI. So, um, so what we can see then is we have a Z4 index for this phase. 
Zero is obviously trivial. One and three correspond to a 2D TI, so that will have gapless surfaces. And so it's only the value of uh, kappa equals two, which is uh, where we have gapped surfaces, and then we can properly see gapless modes on the hinges. Because if we have a gapless surface, we can't really well define um, a gapless hinge mode in addition. So when we talk about the, the Z4 higher order topological phase, we're kind of really just talking about this value of kappa equals two. So I have a quick question about that. Mm -hmm. So is there a meaningful difference between kappa equals one and three? Because it sounds like you're pasting this extra mode into the middle of a TI surface state. Right, so. so the difference, yeah, this is a great question. The difference is how they add. And so actually, so in other words, one plus one, which I, I think I'm actually gonna show on the next slide, is non-trivial. One plus three is trivial. So okay. mm -hmm. yeah, so each one separately, I'm not sure how you would probe that difference except by putting them next to each other. Okay, so, so the surface physics is about the same, but. Yeah, I don't, right. I mean, I think the only distinction is, um, yeah, the sur I don't think the surface physics is really distinguishable in those cases. Uh, you might be, the only way that you could distinguish yeah. them is by putting more stuff on the surfaces. So you might be able to do something, I haven't thought about this, you could possibly do something clever like to gap the surfaces in particular ways and notice that something would be different. But I think really you can only notice the difference if you put them next to each other. Okay, thank or, you. Or um, mesh them together, like kind of add them together as extra degrees of freedom. So um, good, so this is actually kind of where I was <laughs> going next. The, the questions are great. Um, so to be more concrete, we can make a model system, and this has been called the doubled strong TI. So the um, saying that the Z4 index is equal to two basically corresponds to two band inversions. So we can get two band inversions by taking two 3D TIs on, this, on the same lattice, just different orbital degrees of freedom. And if we have these two 3D TIs, we would have two Dirac cones on the top surface, two Dirac cones on the bottom surface, and we know that generically two Dirac cones can gap each other. You know, if we allow them to, to couple generically their gaps. So in previous, in a previous life three years ago, we would have called this a trivial system. Um, but what we now know is that this is actually the higher order TI system. And so basically the mass term, so I'm using blue and pink to denote positive and negative mass. What happens is that the mass term on the top surface and the mass term on the bottom surface are opposite each other. So somewhere there's a domain wall in mass. It can take this pattern or it can take a different pattern. It always just has to be such that two opposite points are separated across this domain wall. And of course, a domain wall in a mass term exactly gives us this 1D helical mode. So, um, so this is kind of the the model system to keep in mind if you're trying to think about higher order TI. So the next question is, um, what I've said so far has been kind of toy models and- Hey, the, hey Jen. Yes. Sorry, quickly. Is there an easy way to see the mass had to be odd? You know, I don't argument? think, yeah, I was thinking about this yesterday. I don't think it's so easy because I was actually looking back at this paper and kind of, it's set up in complete generality such that it, it could or could not be odd. And actually, like if you had, um, I don't think you can tell just from the surface, but if you mm -hmm. made us the absolute simplest possible bulk, mo bulk model, I think it would fall mm -hmm. out naturally. Like there's, there's only, mm -hmm. Um, you know, time reversal acts in a particular way. Therefore, you need to make some operator called inversion that will commute with time reversal. Um, hey, Jen, can you stop for a moment? Yeah. Somebody's sitting in the background with the microphone. Excuse me. Somebody needs to mute your microphone. You are talking to somebody and that's interfering with the seminar. Go on, please. Okay, great, thanks. Um, Anyway, the thing is from the surface physics, I don't think that you can ascertain uh, if you set up a surface model with two Dirac cones, you have to define an inversion operator. And I think you could define it to be even or odd because basically just from the surface, you couldn't tell if you were adding um, 
the higher order TI index one plus one or one plus three. But if you trace back into the bulk and do two identical copies, you'll see that it's that it's opposite. So you know, if if someone in the audience knows a more obvious answer, by all means say it. But my understanding is that there's not a really obvious way from the surface to tell that this mass term had to be odd. And kind of unfortunately. Okay, um, great, good. So, so that's the toy model system. Um, and what I was going to say is, right, so, so the, the majority of this talk is based on toy models. Um, so I'm now going to take the next short period to talk a little bit about material candidates, because I think that the fact, I think that what makes this field so incredibly interesting is that there are materials that can uh, potentially realize these phases. Um, okay, so where can we find higher order TIs in nature? Um, the uh, sorry first, to stop you for a sec. We have a yeah. question from chat yeah. in chat. Great. Um, I can't see the chat when I'm screen sharing, so maybe yeah. they can just read it. Sure. So uh, Nicholas Quirk says, could these top and bottom long edge modes be detected by transport? Right. Good. So, um, so actually, just to like, go back to this picture, if we make a thin sample of this 3D model, it basically looks like a 2D TI. Like if you can imagine squishing this down and then you just look straight down on the top, you see a helical motor on the edge. So it looks like a 2D TI. So I think you could see, I think in thin samples, but not so thin that you ruin the phase, um, you could see the same transport signatures that you would see for a 2D TI. There may also be something clever, I haven't thought about this, in the 3D system to like just look at transport along along one hinge, I'm, I'm, but I'm not positive how that would work. Okay, good. So um, great. If there's no further questions about that, then um, what I was going to say is some materials. Um, I think the most famous material, because it's actually measured, is uh, is bismuth. This is bulk bismuth. So. This is a crystal structure for, for your reference. But the point is, um, this is the band structure. The inversion eigenvalues are shown by plus and minus signs. Some of these trim points have a multiplicity of three. So if you actually want to compute the formula that I showed, you need to um, take that into account. But I can assure you that it works out to have kappa equals two. Um, and if you look at the hinge state pattern that you would expect, because of the C6 rotational symmetry instead of the C4 that I previously been showing, uh, you get these two patterns, which you can see are similar to what I was showing. They're just on a hexagon. Um, so these are the possible patterns of hinge states. And, um, and so what they did is they look at 3D bismuth, they look on the surface, um, and then on the surface, there's this kind of hexagonal pit, which you can see here, and they look at uh, STM um, data and see the density of states is um, enhanced along these kind of every other hinges. And so that's meant to emulate this picture here and give us some evidence that this is a higher order topological phase. Um, there's a lot more in this paper. The point that I want to say is that this phase is not, this material is not actually insulating. So you can see that the very small um, direct gap here and the very small direct gap here don't overlap with each other. So this is not actually an insulating phase. Uh, and so um, for, for people who haven't, haven't thought about this bizarre concept before, why people are taking material that's not insulating, calling it a higher order topological insulator, the reason is just because it's deformable to this higher order TI phase. So if we could take those blue bands and kind of squish them up a little bit or push the red bands down in order to make a direct band gap, um, then it would be a higher order topological insulator. And the index, the higher order TI index is perfectly well defined because we can trace out a continuous band gap, even if it's not a straight line. Uh, is there another question, by the way, in the chat? Well, speak up if there's another question. So bismuth is so. okay. So bismuth is um, bismuth is a very prominent uh, material candidate, but has this hiccup that is not actually insulating. Um, there's a few other candidates. So one, which I'll come back to at the end, is these transition metal dichalcogenides. Um, so they also, these plus and minus signs are meant to show this double band inversion. And they have the same problem as bismuth, which is that there's this continuous um, band gap so that the topological index is well-defined, but the material is not actually insulating. 
And I think tintelluride and some related compounds, which are listed in this reference, are, um, are also pretty promising candidates. And so for these, uh, they have gapless surfaces because they have um, a mirror churn index. And so in order to see the surface states, you need to, uh, in order to see the hinge states, you need to gap the mirror churn surface states. And then once you do that, at least in principle, you should be able to see the hinge mode. And so actually strained tintelluride would be the thing to look at here. Um, because none of these materials are exactly perfect candidates, we um, came up with our own prediction. So this is a paper with my student uh, Yuan Fong at Stony Brook. Uh, and what we realized is that this family of anti-perovskites can also realize the higher order TI phase. And so we can actually explain this rather simply. Um, as I said before, we're looking for kappa, this Z4 index to be equal to two, and this corresponds to two band inversions. And what happens in this family of materials is that um, each one of these two different atoms has uh, j equals three halves orbitals. So one is p orbitals, one is d. But in any case, near the Fermi level, it's these j equals three halves quartets. And you can see that they're inverted at gamma. And so since it's an inversion between groups of four bands, this is a double band inversion. And so, um, and so this is exactly what we need to be in the higher order TI phase. So this double band inversion was already noted previously in this work by Tim Shi uh, and company. Um, basically, they realized the same thing. If you have two band inversions, um, your 3D TI index is trivial, but you have a non-trivial mirror churn index. And so this family of materials was first predicted to be mirror churn uh, insulators. And what we're saying is that it also has a high herder TI insulator uh, index. This is a schematic. Um, if we actually look at the band structure, the gap is invisible at this scale. And if we zoom in um, from this calculation, you can even still barely see it. From the separate calculations, uh, the band gap is estimated to be um, around 50 MeV maximum in this family. So this is not a perfect material either. The band gap is quite small. Uh, we might hope that there could be, you know, some other anti-perovskite, maybe with some even heavier elements, could give us a larger band gap. This is driven by spin orbit coupling. Um, okay, but there's nothing to prevent us from examining this theoretically. So, um, so just to show that this index checks out, what we did was, well, first make a phase diagram, but then um, we were looking for the hinge states. And so what we did was, since this material also has mirror surface states, we had to break mirror symmetry. So we can do this in a few different ways. We can strain the bulk. We can add a perturbation on the surface that you could think of it as a reconstruction that breaks mirror. Or you can choose a surface, um, you can choose a surface normal that breaks mirror symmetry itself so that the, the whole crystal breaks it. In any case, this is for having um, a surface perturbation that breaks, that gaps out the mirror turn surface states. So what we do is we make a, um, a finite size system. It's, it's finite in two directions and infinite in the third direction. And so we can plot a band structure as a function of 1K. And this would be the bulk band gap where the density of states goes from being very dense to a little less dense. Um, then because we added a perturbation to the surface, we have a surface band gap. And inside of this surface band gap, we see this helical mode. So this is, this is the hinge mode. And if we look at one of these states, uh, in real space and look at the density of states, we see it's localized on the corners. So we kind of knew this had to happen because the higher order TI index is non-trivial, but it's kind of nice to verify this um, explicitly. So uh, I find this to be kind of an interesting or promising class of materials. Um, one, because it's tunable. Two, because they actually exist in stable forms uh, in nature. And then, um, but, but in particular, going beyond those reasons, um, one of these candidates that I'm mentioning, this strontium tin oxide, this has been observed to go superconducting. So this gives a um, this gives the opportunity to have superconductivity and uh, helical modes together, which of course is a recipe for realizing Majorana fermions. Um, and then a second reason is that there's some other of these anti-perovskites that are predicted in F electron compounds. And so this is, uh, gives us the possibility to have strong correlations and topology in a single compound. So, um, so I think that this, this uh, class of materials is worthy of a more serious study. 
Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about materials. Now that we know that some materials exist, then that gives us some motivation to try to figure out how to measure them. And so this is kind of the, the, main, um, the main part of the talk. The challenge that we saw is that if you want to observe these hinge modes, you need to make a crystal which is cleaved like very cleanly on two different sides so that you have a very clean interface where these two sides meet each other. And it, you know, I'm not a crystal grower, but to me, this seems like sometimes would probably happen naturally and other times it's gonna be really challenging to get two very clean surfaces. And so, um, so what we wanted to do was look at dislocations and step edges to see if this could be another way to observe hinge states because dislocations are naturally present in, in crystals. So, so the point would be you have some crystal, but its edge termination is maybe not clean, but you can look at step edges on the surface. And if I were to go back to that picture I showed of bismuth, um, that, uh, that hexagonal pit on the surface basically is a step edge. So this is, I think, the practical way that people are going to observe um, the higher order TI phases. So, so the rest of the talk is based on this paper. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators here, especially uh, Raquel and Cosma, um, who I worked really closely with um, in developing the theoretical aspects of this paper. So, so, hey, Jen, quickly then. So just to build on your comments. So basically, if I build a methoscopic, like, like a dice bulk of this material, cleaved it, then the surface would just look conducting. Basically, that's all that'll happen. Because you'd get like a bunch of these. So I'm building off of your comment, challenging to precisely cleave mm -hmm. the crystals. If you don't cleave the crystal, get a bunch of step all over the surface. Um, so you get just hinge modes everywhere, right? You could get On hinge modes everywhere. Or what I was really worried about is that like, Usually crystals, well, it depends a lot on the crystal, but I think like you might be able to make one surface like kind of smooth, but maybe the others would just be so jagged that it would just be a mess. So yeah, you could think of it as hinge okay. modes everywhere, or you could just think of a complete disaster of a surface where you can't really see any sharp, um, like sharp interfaces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. So, um, Great, so that, that's exactly what the problem is. Um, I think the natural way that people are gonna observe these is through step edges. And like I said, I think in bismuth, that's basically what they've done. Um, they just didn't use those words. So, uh, okay, so now I need to explain um, what a dislocation is. So um, there's two kind of classes of dislocations. So in this first one, you insert an extra half plane of material into a crystal. So, so in general, a dislocation is a one-dimensional defect. Away from this 1D line, the crystal is perfect, but when you make a loop around this 1D line, you can detect that there is some defect. And in this edge dislocation example, you insert a half plane of material. And so now if I try to make a loop around this 1D line, I could, for example, go three steps down, three steps over, three up and three over, in a perfect crystal, this would give me a perfect, uh, I'd get back to my starting point, but now there's a mismatch. And this mismatch is called the Burgers vector. And that tells me that I had some defect in my crystal. A screw dislocation is, um, what you do is you slice a material like halfway down a half plane, and then you shift your two half planes that you slice and then glue them back together perfectly. That's what this picture is meant to show. And if you do this same thing of making a loop, you'll see um, a mismatch again. And so the difference between these is in the edge dislocation, the Burgers vector is perpendicular to the line. In the screw dislocation, it's parallel. Doesn't, I don't really need this distinction for the rest that I'm going to say. Um, and then you can also have combinations between these if your dislocation is not a straight line. So dislocations kind of introduce an extra 1D hinge or edge into the system, and that's why they are promising. Um, and so this point was picked up on in 2009 um, in this uh, collaboration where they showed that in weak TIs, a dislocation um, binds a helical mode. And we can understand this rather intuitively if I think of a weak TI as a stack of 2D TIs, and then I make a dislocation like this, um, on, the, on the top surface, there's gonna be a step edge, and that step edge is basically the edge of a 2D TI. So it has this um, gapless edge mode, which will go along the edge, 
And then since it has to go somewhere, it'll go down this uh, dislocation mode in the bulk and then pop out wherever the other edge of the crystal is. Um, so it's kind of intuitive that this would work for a weak TI. And they've given a little more meat to this argument um, by what I call this slice and glue idea. So basically what they say is if you take a weak TI and you cut it in half, um, now you have two surfaces. And these surfaces, because it's a weak TI, these surfaces each have two Dirac cones, say one at zero and one at pi. So if you glue them back together, fine, you can glue them normally and Dirac cones will gap pairwise. You can also glue them with a shift in the Z direction and you'll end up with this phase, which is E to the I K X, where X is gonna be your shift. And so if, you're, um, if your Dirac cone is at pi and your shift is in, in the Z direction, then this is gonna give you a phase of minus one. And so this is saying that there's two different ways to gap this surface with a uh, normal gapping term or another gapping term with a phase. And so these represent two masses. If that phase is minus one, we have two different masses of plus sign and minus sign. And again, if we make a domain wall between these, so that would be on either side of the um, dislocation line, the mass term will change sign. And where it changes sign, then we'll get a helical mode. And this is this, the same helical mode that I was showing on the previous slide. So, um, so from this argument, uh, it leads to this general criteria, which is if you know the Burgers vector, which is what V is here, um, and then you know this vector M, M is constructed from the weak TI indices. So you pick some reciprocal lattice vectors and compute the weak TI indices in that direction. Then if B dot M gives you pi, you'll have a helical mode on the dislocation characterized by that Burgers vector. If it gives you zero or two pi, um, then you won't. And so in our previous example of a stack of 2D TIs, this vector M will be, um, so basically in this formula for M, nu three will be one. So M will be G over G three over two. Our Burgers vector is in the Z direction. And so when we dot these things together, we get pi. And so that's how the formula works out to uh, corresponding to this picture. And this, um, you know, topological defects have been classified. And so this is a part of a table in this paper by T.O. and Kane. And basically what we're looking at is this picture here, which is saying if we're in three dimensions and we have this um, line defect that we can make a one dimensional loop around, then they tell us that the classification will be Z2. And the formula that I just showed um, gives us a way to get that Z2 index from the Burgers vector and weak TI indices. Okay, so that's the uh, previous work on how dislocations have been used to probe weak TIs. Now I'm going to go back to higher order TIs and show how we um, how we've made a higher order TI model which also has um, dislocations that carry gapless modes. So this is a particular model and I'll kind of then explain what's special about it or not special. So I already said you can realize a higher order TI by having this doubled strong TI model, which has two 3D TIs in the bulk. What we're now gonna do is make a special version of this, which separates these 3D TIs in space. So we have an A sub lattice, which is like these green lines, and a B sub lattice, which is the pink line. So we have two interpenetrating 3D TIs. If we at first don't couple them, then there's a translation symmetry going from pink to green, um, which is what I call Z. And so if we don't couple them, uh, this is actually a weak TI. Um, on its top surface, these things both have a Dirac cone, and so that Dirac cone can just gap. Um, but on the side surface, because these are offset in space, their Dirac cones end up being offset in momentum space. And so this is characteristic of a weak TI. You have a gap top and um, two Dirac cones on the side. What we can do is then couple these sub lattices. So if we add a um, pink to green coupling, which is basically, it's gonna have a different amplitude from pink to green as green to pink, then we, uh, we increase the lattice spacing. So what we're doing is breaking the translation vector from pink to green down to such that the full translation is now twice that, 2z. And when we double the unit cell, we fold the Bruin zone. And so that ends up folding the side Bruin zone and then these two Dirac cones can gap. And so now we have the situation um, 
that we want, which is gapped, all gapped surfaces. And um, again, I can't really prove this like cleanly, or I can't prove it easily from the surface that I've just described, but these two pink and blue um, gapped surfaces have opposite signs of their mass term. And so they will actually, this realizes the higher order or TI phase, and we have this helical mode, which is um, which is tracing out this uh, this pattern drawn by these by this yellow line, and we we knew that we had to get this because the two 3D TIs interpenetrating this gives us a higher order TI. Okay, so the only thing special about this model is the two 3D TIs are offset. Question? Yeah, hey Jen, uh, Jay again. Uh, so quick, so is it is it entirely obvious that shifting along the z direction shifts also in momentum space the direct cones on the side surface? Um, because at least naively in terms of wave functions, the real space shift part of momentum eigenstate is just a phase shift. Yeah, so we're I guess we're doing something. Um, when we double the unit cell, they end up being at the same point. So we're doing something kind of weird here, which is like having these two lattices not talk to each other uh, at all. You're only having hopping, you know, every other site hopping. Um, I don't know. The only thing that I can think, which is like kind of, I mean, obvious isn't the right word. Um, Let's see, like if you, yeah, I don't think that there's an obvious, I need to actually think back. So, so the model that we're using is actually, the, you know, I've been drawing a lot of pictures. So to be concrete, this is actually the model. Um, mu, the, each, this first bracket is a 3D TI type binding model and mu is our sub lattice space. Um, and so if we if we follow this through and look at the surface theory, then we can verify where the Dirac cones are going to be on the side surface. Um, but it's escaping me at the moment how we can actually tell that these two Dirac cones would not be in the same place, except that um, we can before we couple them, we have a weak TI index. We can actually look at the inversion eigenvalues at the different trim points, and so we can check. Um, like it it kind of depends on how you define inversion to act on your system, but you can check then based on inversion eigenvalues that you have two inversions at different trim points, and that's what's characteristic of a weak TI. Um, yeah, so I don't think that's exactly the answer that you're looking for, um, but we can check in this model that this is how it works out to be. Sure, thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Uh, like I said, to be concrete, this is our model of before the two lattices are coupled. This first term preserves translation symmetry and gaps out the Dirac cones on the top surface. Um, the translation operator is basically mu x because it exchanges these sub lattices. Um, and then the second term breaks translation symmetry and that's how we ultimately gap out the Dirac cones on the side surfaces. Once we do this coupling, because the Brun zone is folded, um, all of the weak indices disappear. The lattice vector, just to reiterate, is I'm calling it 2z, and the higher order ti index is now 2. It was actually 2 the whole time. Um, okay, good. So this is our model. And what we now want to do is put a dislocation into this model. Um, and so we first do this numerically. So let me just say what this plot is actually showing. Uh, we're plotting the density of states within a certain energy window of zero, zero being within the bulk gap. So because um, there's a bulk gap and because the surfaces are gapped, then uh, we don't see any blue dots uh, in here, but these blue dots are telling us about our hinge state. So then we put a dislocation into this system um, and we see that we get extra gapless modes occurring along the dislocation. So we can see numerically that, um, that a dislocation in this model find some kind of gapless mode. And if we look further, um, so now what we've made is a plot which is uh, finite in two directions, but infinite in the third direction. Um, so we're plotting along the momentum in that direction. Uh, we can see that 
these gapless states are linearly dispersing, we could also check that they're Kramer's partners of each other. And so this is a proper helical mode, which we knew that it had to be. And if we look in real space, we can also see this localization. This is looking like down the top of our, um, of our sample. And this is the core of the dislocation, and this is where the dislocation kind of shows up on the outside surface. So this is, um, this leads to some kind of uh, contradiction or apparent contradiction, which is, I told you that all the weak indices in this model uh, were trivial. This vector M is a vector of weak indices. So it doesn't seem like for any choice of Berger's vector, um, you know, whenever, for any Berger's vector, we'll always get B dot M equals zero. So, so the question is then, why is it that we have these um, helical modes? Let me first give an analytical argument why we know that these things have to be there um, so that maybe I can convince you that you're not being tricked by the numerics. Um, so the argument is that before we coupled, I had two 3D TIs on what I'm calling the pink lattice and the green lattice. Before we coupled them, we had a weak TI. So we know that if we make a dislocation um, and the Berger's vector is this, what I call uh, Z hat, then we can take b dot m equals pi and we know that this dislocation will bind a helical mode on the step edge and also going down in the bulk. But this helical mode doesn't need translation symmetry to protect it. So when we do these perturbations that uh, couple the two lattices and break translation symmetry, that's not going to affect the helical mode at all. So this helical mode is kind of a remnant of, um, of being in the weak TI phase. But still, uh, then we have to ask, well, how does it, um, how does it escape this B dot M formula? How can we reconcile the fact that all of our weak TI indices are zero, um, but we can still get this? And the, the reason is because this dislocation that we've made is actually, um, the Berger's vector is only now half of a lattice vector. This is why I'm calling it a partial dislocation. Um, and so, so let me explain what this picture on the left is meant to show. In our combined system, the lattice vector is 2z. So it goes from pink to pink. So if we made a full dislocation, it would have to span two layers, uh, like this dislocation with Berger's vector capital B. But what we've actually done is made this kind of half dislocation, which is we just have um, we're just having a Berger's vector which goes from green to pink, which in our new system is not a full lattice vector. And so this M dot B classification doesn't apply to these partial lattice dislocations. Um, in fact, M dot B is not well defined unless B is a full lattice vector. So the formula is actually ill-posed. Um, the right-hand picture is showing the same thing, but for screw dislocations instead of edge dislocations. And so, the, um, so what we've done is introduced a partial dislocation, which hasn't been much studied in the context of TIs. Um, and the other thing to note is that when you make a partial dislocation like this, you're actually creating a 2D defect. So I framed it like it was a 1D defect um, line, but actually you can see that when you take out like an extra half plane here, you now have a half plane where you have pink next to pink instead of the usual alternating pattern of pink, green, pink. So we've actually made a 2D defect um, from this partial dislocation. And, um, and if we try to adapt this slice and glue argument, what happens is that if we slice our higher order TI, these two side surfaces are gapped. We'll give them some mass. You know, you can't really define a mass except relative to another mass. So there's some mass term here. But if we look at the low energy theory, and we now shift one edge up by another to make the dislocation, what happens is that the mass on one side changes sign. Um, and so now when we put this back together, um, what happens is that the, uh, we now have a defect between a mass uh, that's changing sign, and so there's a helical mode at the boundary. Um, and so, so this is what, how I'm depicting putting them back together. Um, if we call this the normal side, this is the side where the stacking fault is. And anywhere we have a boundary between pink and blue, uh, we have a gapless mode. And so one way to think of the stacking fault in this system is that the stacking fault um, is kind of like an embedded 2D topological insulator. It's, you know, topologically, it's the same thing as if we jammed a 2D TI into this system. And actually, um, a couple of years ago, there was this neat paper called Embedded TIs. Um, and 
in that paper, they actually mentioned dislocations like this. And so this is a concrete um, example of how this can occur. And these are exactly the types of dislocations which can show, um, well, in our model, it shows a helical mode on a step edge. You might worry that because this is now a two-dimensional defect, that it, um, that it will have like macroscopic energy and that this sort of thing will never occur in crystals. And that's actually not the case because if these, if these pink and green layers that I'm talking about are very similar to each other, um, they don't really have a problem being near each other. So in certain crystals, actually, in certain, in certain crystals, partial lattice dislocations are extremely common. In others, of course, they would never happen. Um, and so we need to ask, like, what are the types of crystals where these things are common? And are there higher order TIs in these types of crystals? Um, Okay, since I'm approaching the end, okay, so, so the other important thing to say is, how can we detect these step edges? Well, basically the same way that we would detect helical modes on step edges and weak TIs. Uh, we can either look at a step edge with STM and try to measure density of states. You know, in a very ideal system, it would be spin resolved density of states and we could see a helical mode um, that might be kind of testing the, the limits of, of this technology. Um, and the other neat idea, which was proposed in regarding the dislocations and weak TIs, is that what if you have a crystal and you have many of these defects and they're all a bunch of aligned dislocations, then basically they would promote transport in one direction. Um, and so in principle, if you could engineer two crystals, one with very few defects and one with many defects, um, you could see this enhanced conductivity in one direction. But again, this is, this is kind of a it's a very tricky um, thing to, to observe in a compelling manner. Um, as, so circling back to materials that I was mentioning, these transition metal dicalcogenides uh, in 3D, they actually realize a variety of possible phases, but in one particular phase, they have two layers in the unit cell, um, kind of like I was describing in our toy model. In order to have a partial dislocation, you need to have two layers in the unit cell. Otherwise, you're going to have a half edge, which is a bunch of dangling atoms, and that won't be energetically favorable. And you can see here, like these two layers are actually very similar to each other. I think they're just like reflected copies. So this is a system where having a partial dislocation is um, is is reasonable to think about. And certainly you can think about a partial step edge because since it has two layers in the unit cell, a, kind of the easiest possible step edge on the surface would just be half of a lattice vector. Um, so this is some data from a, a tungsten ditelluride in two-dimensional form, not realizing the 3D phase, but I'm listing it here because I think like this is a very promising place to look for the 3D phase. Um, and since they've already been able to see step edges and peaks in the density of states in the 2D phase, it's, it's likely that this is a promising place um, where you could also see step edges and maybe helical modes on the density of states in the 3D phase. Um, and then you also, the natural question to ask is, well, what about bismuth, which I said in the beginning is one of the, um, well, the only measured and predicted higher order um, TI. And so we actually thought about this in collaboration with Binghai. Um, what happens in bulk bismuth is you have two atoms in the unit cell. So that's good because that's one of my prerequisites. I need to have different layers to get these partial dislocations. And it's actually, they're almost symmetrically arranged. And so if these, if we trace up this like one, one, one axis, if they were symmetric, they'd be at 0.25 and 0.75, but in fact, they're at 0.24 and 0.76. So they're almost symmetrically arranged. So, so bulk bismuth is actually kind of has this feature where it's very close to having a higher uh, translation symmetry, which in our case would be taking the higher order TI and deforming backwards to a weak TI. So, um, so Binghai tried to do this deformation um, but what happens in bismuth is if you, if you symmetrize it to move these atoms to be exactly at the symmetric positions, then uh, you don't get an insulator. You actually get this half-filled band. And if you count the number of bands, this had to happen. You can't get an insulator just by band counting the bands that are near the Fermi level. Um, and so, bismuth, so although we actually made our model um, wanting to uh, learn about bismuth. In the end, bismuth doesn't fit into this paradigm. 
you know, because I'm not going to make so bold of a, a claim to say that it applies to all higher order TIs. What we did was make a specific higher order TI, which is deformable to a weak TI um, by adding, enhancing translation symmetry. And in this myth, if you do this enhancement, you don't get a weak TI, you get a half filled band. And so the question of, so we kind of one of the open questions is to generalize uh, this theory to make it, um, to, to apply to this, this myth case. Um, okay, the other thing that I was going to say is there's a kind of separate idea of intrinsic versus extrinsic TIs. And, you know, since we're at the end of the hour, um, I won't really say this. You can ask if you want. Um, we also made a model looking at defects in these extrinsic TIs. Um, and there's actually another material candidate. Um, this material is worth commenting on because it, again, has this property where you have like two different types of layers, but you can easily imagine having a partial dislocation because these red layers are actually the same as each other. It's just that the intermediates are different. Um, so so you, you can imagine a case where if you had like a screw dislocation, these red layers would bond perfectly, and then there'd be a mismatch at the edge of this layer and this layer. And I guess it remains to see if that mismatch would be, you know, how energetically unfavorable it is. Um, and unifying these results, like, so what we want, what we don't have is a bulk criterion. You give me a Berger's vector, you give me some symmetry or um, TI indices in the bulk, how can I figure out if that Berger's vector is gonna bind a helical mode? And the closest that we could come to this was a parity criterion, which is if you take a partial Berger's vector such that you can combine n copies of it to get a full lattice vector, then you can ask how many helical modes are going to be um, on that dislocation. And we have this parity constraint depending on whether n, uh, which is the number of partial lattice vectors that you need to make a full lattice vector is even or odd, and then dotting this with the weak TI indices. Um, so we have all these different cases, but the, the models that we're looking at fall into this case where we actually don't get a constraint from this criterion. So another kind of future direction that I think is interesting would be to look at like some of these other cases where you can actually prove based on parity um, that, that your dislocation would have to have uh, a helical mode or that you need to have a gap stacking fault, uh, a gapless stacking fault. So I think, um, so what, what I wanna do in the future is make a, is try to generalize this theory to apply to say all higher order TIs that have two different sub lattices and there has to be some constraint on the sub lattices of how inversion acts on them. And I expect that this is possible because um, we can actually deform a step edge to become a hinge mode. So there's kind of some general connection between these. If you take this step edge, stretch it out to the end, and then uh, chop off the rest, you have a hinge mode. And so there should be a general connection. And um, we hesitated to make that leap because we wanted to kind of not overstep the conclusions of our model. Okay, so um, I think I mentioned all of these ideas. So in summary, uh, the idea is that previously, uh, classifications of topological defects have looked over these partial dislocations because they're kind of messy and introduce these 2D stacking faults. Um, but, but in many crystals, partial dislocations can occur. We've made a model where they um, do occur and they can host helical modes. And so we think that this is a promising way to probe either higher order TIs or other topological phases. Um, and then also, I just want to mention um, some some of the stuff I said about materials. I think these anti-perovskites are promising higher order TI candidates and, um, and also advertise our review article, which kind of goes over some of the principles and symmetry indicators and topological quantum chemistry. So um, great, that's all that I wanted to say and I'd be happy to take questions. All right, thank you very much, Jen, for the wonderful talk. Um, yeah, so let's open up if there are remaining questions. Can I ask a question? Right, so um, hi, so this is Yiting, and um, I'm just wondering um, if there's any um, relation between the defect that's used to bind modes and the protecting symmetry. So um, in your case, these uh, higher order TIs, they're all protected by inversion, right? Yeah. So um, can I see um, how the this partial dislocation 
has right. anything to do with the inversion symmetry? Yes, that's a, that is actually the key question. And I have some ideas in this direction, but I haven't really gotten around to uh, making them correct. So yeah, so exactly. We, we have these two lattices and to start with, they each have inversion symmetry. So we actually have a lot of inversion centers. They can mix in themselves under inversion, but they also can mix into each other under inversion. What we do is break our lattice translation symmetry from Z to 2Z. When we do that, we pick out half of these inversion centers. And so we could have broken it in different ways, but we chose to break it in a certain way. Um, and what happens is that like how you break the translation symmetry determines whether inversion mixes your two sublattices or um, or leaves each sublattice invariant. And we need to do this in a particular way such that the mass term that we get on the surface is odd under inversion. So I think there, what I think, but I don't know is true, is that the, I think we can come up with a condition which will be if you have two sublattices and if inversion um, either leaves a sublattice invariant or mixes, I think one of those is going to lead us to the case that has helical mode on the dislocation and the other one is not. And I kind of now forget which one is which, but I have like some pictures which I think can show this. Um, so I think there is a connection and I actually didn't, um, right, I didn't make that clear enough in here. The point is that the mass term on the surface is odd under, um, under half lattice translation. And I think it probably is also odd under inversion. So like when we do this slice and glue, when I shift up by half a lattice, I said the mass term changes sign. That's because mass is odd under this half lattice translation. And you know, in our model, of course, this can all be tested explicitly, but what remains is to figure out what are the like bulk symmetry criterion that will guarantee these things to be true. I see. I see. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, can I ask a question? Uh, so my question is about the the part you mentioned about the uh, enhancing transport in the presence of the dislocation. Yes. So I imagine that you you specifically mean for your disoccurrence side, you mean uh, that uh, uh, if I put a lead on the top and bottom uh, surfaces, and then because I'm basically counting how many helical mode penetrating the box. But if I if I do similar thing, um, sorry, can you go to that? Um, Is this that, the slide that you were talking about? Yeah, you mentioned that when you when you show this uh, figure. But I'm thinking about a, a simpler case where you only have one dislocation. Ah, uh -huh. And I'm thinking about you put a lead on the front and the back, and uh, since one of the like yes, one of the helical mode will inter will will, will overlap mm -hmm. with this uh, this uh, uh, this closed loop, uh, and I would imagine that because helical mode by itself there's no back scattering, um, you know, absence of interaction. But now you have two helical mode, but contact at one point. So I should I expect that the transport actually should be reduced. I see. So what? I think I understand what you're saying. What you're saying is that I'm calling this thing a dislocation, but I also have transport in this direction. So why is this the preferred direction? Uh, not exactly. I mean, that I understand. When you put a lead on the top and bottom, basically, mm -hmm. you just call the, 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 the perpendicular to the lead, uh, the, the cross section. But now I put a lead in the front and in the back. Mm -hmm. So my pe my penetrating path will be two, but a lot of them will, will have some interaction. So I should not say interaction will over that with this closed loop. Mm -hmm. And I'm worried that uh, the over that with the closed loop, that, that particular helical mode will have a reduced uh, conductance. Well, it looks like if we just take this picture quite literally, it seems mm -hmm. like the only way that you can access this loop is if you have contacts on the top and bottom. If you have a contact on like the left side and the right side, the problem is that the right side is not going to, like, it's not going to touch this loop. And furthermore, we, we could have made two dislocations inside of the bulk. Um, you know, they don't have to reach out to this side surface. So really like this, this loop should, 
if your dislocations were perfect lines, they should pop out at the top and bottom and also go across, but they don't necessarily need to touch any of the side surfaces. So I, I think see. they would be inaccessible um, from the sides. You know, this is all very idealized, but yeah. So I guess it's hard to make a sharp statement about the transport to detect the dislocation. Yeah, so there is, um, I should have, I actually should have cited, um, so I cited this this paper, they're talking about thermoelectric um, enhancement as well. There actually is an experimental paper. Um, I don't remember which material it's on where they actually tried to do this. Um, so, so we can look up the reference later. You know, I can, we, I'm sure that I can find it. And unfortunately I need to, I should add a citation here. They actually tried to do this so that, you know, if you're thinking about that sort of thing, but it's an experimental paper. I don't remember if there's, I don't remember seeing any serious theory in that direction. So it might actually be interesting to think about how to, how you would set up the experiment. Realistically, is there something that you could observe or is it going to be quite small? Um, you know, those, those sorts of things and looking at their experimental paper might give some, uh, you know, guidance or inspiration. But it's actually kind of cool that they, you know, they can actually grow a lot of, in this particular case that I'm thinking of, they can actually make a lot of dislocations and they can kind of choose, choose-ish that to make them aligned in a certain way and they have a preferential direction of them. And that's kind of neat because you might have thought that that was a hopeless endeavor. Um, but these things don't occur completely randomly in crystals. Like if they apply small amounts of strain, it will dictate the direction of the dislocations. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. JP mentions in chat that they have, uh, he comments that they have um, experimental evidence of possible HOTI modes in molybdenum ditelluride under pressure. Ah, wait, this is published or? Uh, there's an archive link. Ah, ah, oh, great, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry for not, um, yeah, I didn't actually, somehow I didn't actually notice that, thank you. Uh, yeah, Jen, I sent you an email too. <laughs> okay, great, great, thank you. Uh, in, in essence, uh, what we see, this is a bit old now, but it's, it's still being reviewed. Under pressure, this system has some kind of transition. And there's an intermediate phase where we think there's basically uh, some change in the stacking. And the interesting thing is that we see uh, robust quantum oscillations that are unique from the low pressure and the higher pressure phase in this intermediate phase. And it exists right between the the structural change between the two phases. Mm -hmm. So you said it has to be some kind of topological states that are probably related to dislocations or the layers or the edges. So you said molybdenum detailuride. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. I'll look at your email. Um. So, okay. So I guess my memory is that there's the bulk phases, there's like several different phases. So you're saying probably that you applied pressure to get into the higher order TI phase and you're looking near the transition of these? Yeah, it's actually between the two, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it's the monoclinic and the- uh, or Yeah. The high and low temperature phase that's at ambient pressure. Okay. When you apply pressure, that boundary gets shrunk to zero and there's a finite region of pressure where the two phases coexist. I see. And uh, so that's the region where we see uh, distinct Fermi surface. You can see the paper for more details. Yeah, no, I'm really interested. Um, good, thank, yeah, thank, I'm, I apologize for not citing and no thanks problem. for pointing it out because yeah, I'm really interested. Uh, hi, Jen. This is Tomokra. I had a very uh, small, in principle, naive question about uh, uh, about bismuth. So, uh, in the presence of interactions in a real material, how do you think of uh, the metallic phase being smoothly connected to an atomic limit or not, since the deformations here are no longer adiabatic? So... Okay, you're talking about um, this uh, band structure. Um, 
Right. So in the non-interacting limit, there's absolutely no problem. Um, but you're saying that I'm, I'm not sure if there is a problem in the interacting limit. Is there? Um, I guess what I would think is, well, it depends on what the interactions are doing to your system. But I guess what I would think is that if you have this um, insulating gap, you know, f forget the, the actual material considerations, but in theory, we can always take a, a continuous insulating gap and, oh, I see, you're saying the different K points are not going to be well-defined perhaps in the interacting system. Right. Hmm. Interesting. So you could possibly, even though you're not plotting a band structure, you can still get at translation eigenstates. So the you know k points could still be defined in some way. So you may be able to define some kind of deformation that talks to different k points differently. Uh, I see. But so then we're talking about many particle, many body eigenstates of the system, not single particles. So and I'm trying to figure out how uh, we should think of band deformations because usually naively we think of band deformations as being adiabatic yeah. changes. And here there is no energy gap uh, in in the presence of interactions. So uh, yeah, there's no energy gap in the presence of interactions, but you, I guess what I'm wondering is, can we still define, you know, we can still pick out uh, translation eigenstates. Um, and so could we somehow think of a way to target particular translation eigenstates, like to, to separate out into different sectors and smoothly, like, within each sector, if there was a gap, if you could change the gap in that sector. I'm not sure if that's possible. That's the only idea. I haven't thought of this question. Um, that's the only idea that I have. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm not All sure right. Thanks. Can. Yeah. Hi, Jim. Uh, this is Rishin. Oh, hi. And uh, actually, I'm quite, uh, I'm wondering if, uh, have you thought about like the application of your theory to uh, the axial insulators, like with higher topology, that we, where you, you don't have time or symmetry, but if you have these, you know, inversion protected uh, chiral hinge modes. Actually, that's a that's a good. So, so the answer is no. I haven't thought about it, and um, there's nothing special here about time reversal. So, you know, so our mission was basically the bismuth experiment is confusing because you have a step edge, not a full, well, great, I'm on exactly the right slide. You have a step edge, not a full, um, you know, full outside of a crystal. So it gave us some motivation to study step edges and therefore we restricted ourselves to class A2 and worked with a concrete model. Of course, the other approach to the problem is to try to not work with concrete models and do a real topological classification. Um, I think the chiral case in some ways can be easier because, you know, chiral modes are even more robust um, in some sense. Uh, so I, what I expect is that you could make a similar model for the axion insulator by doing our idea of like two offset lattices. Um, and I think that would all carry through. The, the even more interesting thing would be to try to make a, um, to try to see if there was some uh, symmetry to make a more robust classification than just a particular model. So in a particular material, fine, maybe you can make a model and maybe it's quite convincing. Um, but, you know, it'd be nice to be able to use symmetry to make a better classification of these than have to say, are you deformable to a weak TI? Or in your case, it would probably be, are you deformable to like a 3D, you know, churn insulator? Um, yeah, maybe we can talk more about this, actually, yeah. Thank you. Are there any further questions? All right, well, if not, thank you very much to, uh, to Jen, and um, thank you all for coming, To and um, feel free um, to, uh, if, if you all want to stick around, you're welcome to, um, the room will be open for a while yet.